Welcome back to the second session of the first day of the conference. I am Margherita Bottero from the Bank of Italy and one of the coordinators of the network. And I'm very pleased to chair this session on monetary policy transmission through the banking sector, so one of the core channels of transmission of monetary policy, at least in the euro area. And uh, the rules of the game are like this morning, so we're going to have the presenter, the discussant, and then open the floor. We're going to see two papers, uh, stop for a short break, and then resume for the last paper. Let me introduce the first uh, presenter of uh, the day, of, oh, sorry, of the session, Christoph Basten from the University of Zurich, presenting his paper on monetary policy transmission through cross-selling banks. Yeah, thank you so much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this exciting research at this uh, very exciting conference. It's on monetary policy transmission fitting with a conference theme, and it's on transmission through cross-selling banks. By cross-selling banks, I mean that the banks sell different products to the same client, and they will take that into account uh, when setting prices. So we've heard this morning that for transmission, it is important uh, to what extent policy rate changes are passed through to depositors. And what we focus on in this paper is how this pass-through depends on the cross-selling strategies. It's joint work with Ragnar Jutzroth from the Norwegian Central Bank, and so the usual disclaimer applies. What got us to start on this topic? Um, in the past two or so years, major central banks, uh, including the ECB, have raised policy rates. And uh, as we've also heard uh, this morning, um, deposit rates have been increased much less. This has outraged parts of the public, um, it has not uh, so much outraged economists because we know at the latest since Monty Klein that banks, of course, use whatever market power they have to charge a positive deposit spread between policy rates and deposit rates. And I will talk later uh, how we want to define market power. So this was the first step to understand that cross-sectionally banks want to charge a positive deposit spread. The next step um, in understanding deposit pricing was Drexler Savov Schnabel's Deposit Channel of Monetary Policy paper, very influential, and they showed reasons why banks might not only want to charge a positive deposit spread, but have the deposit spread increase in policy rates. So there is what they called a positive deposit spread better. So this already helps us understand a lot about deposit pricing, but to my mind, there were two major gaps. One is neither Monty Klein nor uh, the DSS paper has allowed us to understand why banks would accept a negative deposit spread. And yet, until two or so years ago, uh, the euro area and other major currency areas have had negative policy and interbank rates, yet banks would choose non-negative deposit rates, and so the spread was negative. And in Monte Klein or DSS, it's not clear why banks would do that. They could more cheaply refinance their lending through covered bonds or in the interbank market. So when I was working on negative rates earlier, I asked many bankers, so why don't you try uh, negative deposit rates, you don't need all this refinancing. The bankers would tell me, you're right, we don't need this refinancing, but we want to keep the depositors because we want to cross-sell them other products in the future. Um, and this uh, got me to work in the project cited at the bottom with uh, Ragnar Jutzroth, and uh, which uh, was accepted by the RFS last year. Um, in this paper, we show empirically uh, that cross-selling to households is important. So we find that uh, if you have deposits with a certain bank, that makes you 20 percentage points more likely to also buy a mortgage from that bank. So this was cross-sectional, and in the next step I started thinking, but how does that incentive vary with the policy rate, and therefore how might it matter for monetary policy transmission? So this is what today's paper is about. Uh, I will introduce the hypothesis from a theoretical point of view. Then it's standard. I will introduce data and strategy and then go to the results. So I said earlier in the uh, paper Bust and Yields Road 2023, we found that certain demographics are more likely to cross by a, a mortgage from the same bank. 
And interestingly, these same demographics tend to get lower deposit spread, which is to say they earn higher deposit rates. In particular, what we found, you can see this on the slide, parents and those aged below 30 are more likely to buy a house in the coming years. So they are more likely to bring in mortgage business to the bank and the banks offer them better deposit rates to attract and, uh, and keep them in the first place. In fact, as you see at the bottom of the slide, there's two uh, drivers of this difference across demographics in effective deposit spreads. One is supply. So the banks we look at offer higher deposit rates on accounts for which you're only eligible, for example, if you are a university student, if you're young, if you have kids. This is supply. There is also a demand component uh, beyond effective deposit spreads because the young, for example, are more likely to re-optimize what type of account they have within their bank or even to switch banks in order to get the best possible deposit rates. In importantly, this cross-selling of loans op often happens a few years after someone's onboarded. So someone would finish high school, maybe open a deposit account, they buy their first house three, four, five or more years later. So when the bank wants to uh, to think about how profitable it is to win that client, uh, these benefits of cross-selling to that client a mortgage have to be discounted. Now, what do these findings of uh, last year's paper, what do they imply for the optimal deposit pricing of a bank? At the top here, you see uh, the Monte Klein model of deposit pricing. So this model says the bank sets the deposit rate RD, uh, as a spread against the policy rate R, and then clients will choose the deposit volume D as a result of that. And so in that very simplified model, uh, banks want to choose RD so as to maximize this one period uh, deposit profit. What our findings from last year suggest though is that it might make sense to add a second term here, um, which are tomorrow's uh, loan profits. So L is the loan volume and we showed that this tends to be larger, the larger the deposit volume the household already has with that bank. Um, and then you wanna multiply that with the loan spread, L of R. And importantly, because the cross-selling happens later, you want to discount it. So what this implies is, first, the bank trades off earning a lower deposit spread today against uh, selling a larger deposit volume today, that's already in Monte Klein. And what is new to, uh, through our research is against also uh, selling a bigger loan tomorrow. And the resulting incentive uh, for loss leader pricing, as you may call it, the resulting incentive to set a lower deposit spread today is more pronounced the lower our policy rates, because when policy rates are very low or even negative if, as they've been here until recently, um, the NPV of these cross-selling profits will catris paribus be larger. And what this implies is, again, a positive deposit spread better. This is something which DSS have already given us another reason for. So what we want to know empirically is which of these reasons is it, or is it both? What is their relative importance? And that's what the empirical part of this paper will be about. So here you can see the positive deposit spread better. So the higher policy rates, the higher on average the effective deposit spread. That's the average. Um, it does differ across banks. So what you see here is the deposit better. How much does the policy rate vary with the policy rate and the deposit spread better, how much does the spread vary with the uh, policy rate is also very heterogeneous across banks. And that makes us wonder why is it different? What bank characteristic or choice makes this deposit better or deposit spread better differ? So the hypothesis we have is that the deposit spread better will be increasing in deposit market power, that's DSS, the Deposit Chain of Monetary Policy, that's point A here, but what is new to our paper, we say it might differ by deposit market power, but importantly, it will also differ by the conversion 
from deposits to loans, by the extent to which the banks take into account that once they've onboarded you as a depositor, they can sell you a loan later on. What data do we use? So we use data from Norway outside the euro area. Why? Because the data quality is amazing there, and I will hopefully uh, show, uh, explain why this is the case. Namely, we have data on the universe, every household, every bank, every year. We see the volume of deposits and loans, and we see the interest um, any household receives from any bank for the deposits, and any household pays to any bank for their loans. Then we compute the key measure of interest to us, which we call deposit loan conversion. So we see what is the um, percentage change from the deposit amount in that bank household relationship to the loan uh, amount, if there is any borrowing later, uh, later on. So in contrast to last year's paper where we stayed entirely at the relationship level, here we then aggregate all outcomes and all variables of interest to the bank municipality year level. So we bunch together all households in the same municipality. I will explain in the next section on the strategy why we do this. Uh, summary statistics for reference if there are questions later on. Um, so I've said the uh, objective of our empirical analysis is to distinguish why is there this positive deposit spread better. The most obvious thing is lending opportunities. When policy rates are lower, uh, this might increase demand for loans. And if the banks have more lending to refinance, they offer a lower deposit spread, so they make deposits more attractive in order to raise more deposits to refinance that extra lending. Then the second possibility is deposit market concentration. That's the deposit channel of monetary policy. And the, first, the third one is this cross-selling potential. Now, how can we differentiate between these three drivers? Drexler, Savov, Schnabel in 2017 faced a similar tr uh, question. They had to wanted to differentiate between drivers one or two, lending opportunities and deposit market power. What they did is they compared the deposit pricing of branches of US banks uh, within the same bank year. Why? Because the market concentration uh, is different or is often different from branch to branch. One branch is in a highly concentrated market, another one is in a, in a less concentrated one. Um, but they make the point that the deposits are then pooled at the bank level. So by making these comparisons within the same bank year, they can keep lending opportunities fixed and therefore cleanly identify the effect on the deposit spread better of um, deposit market power. Their strategy has more recently been criticized uh, because other researchers have pointed out that only 15% of US banks set different prices at the branch level. Um, so this does not disprove that at US banks or European or any banks, deposit prices are related to market concentration, but at least the DSS strategy has limited external validity because explicitly they've shown this only for those 15% of banks. Our strategy instead builds on the finding I introduced earlier that cross-selling opportunities and um, the deposit spread better differ across demographics. And we exploit this by using the fact that different municipalities in Norway have different demographics. So in downtown Oslo, you have a very different age composition. Uh, you have a different, different um, number of kids per household than in the countryside. So what we do is we compare uh, the deposit spread better uh, across municipalities within a bank year. And therefore, thereby we seek to also control for lending opportunities or for refinancing needs, if, as you might want to call it. Um, as a motivational slide, I start here by just relating the change in the deposit spread at the top of columns one and two 
to the change in the policy rate um, in column one without, in column two with bank fixed effects. And it doesn't make much of a difference. What you see is about 70% of the policy rate increase is passed through. And therefore, the other 30% go into the deposit spread. So, so the pass through here on average is, is higher, interestingly, than what we heard this morning, uh, 40%. Um, of course, this depends a lot on uh, what subsample of observation to use on the time horizon. So this is within the same calendar year, because that's the frequency of our data. But you see, on average, there is a positive relationship between the policy rate and the deposit spread. And as a result, columns three and four, when the policy rate goes up and deposit prices go up, deposit growth goes down. Now, this is not at all causal, because here uh, we just compare across years, and we cannot control for lending opportunities. We can and do do this once we're interested not in the average, but on how this differs across banks. So in columns one to four, the outcome is, again, the change in the deposit spread. And in columns five and to eight, it's the resulting volume, deposit growth. We start uh, without bank year fixed effects. And you see here the coefficient is 0.02. I'll, I'll shortly say what that means, actually. But what the first thing worth noting is this falls by more than 50% once we add the bank year fixed effect from 0.02 to 0.007. So this shows you that adding these bank year fixed effects really is important. Um, here we start including only the interaction between the policy rate change and our conversion measure. Um, then, as a sort of horse race, we include instead the interaction of a policy rate change with the market share of that bank in that municipality. And then we include both. And you can see when we include both, this does not make much of a difference. Um, so what is the relative importance of these two drivers? Um, what you see, I think it's worth uh, the, the exact coefficient, of course, depends on the scaling. So let us compare the effect on the deposit spread beta of cross-selling versus market concentration by comparing the effect of one standard deviation in each of these two variables. So if we increase uh, conversion by one standard deviation, that's 4.8 units, we find the, de the deposit spread increases by four basis points. If we instead increase ma the market share by one standard deviation, that's 0 0.01 units, it increases by 0 0.47 basis points. So roughly, this is to say the effect on the deposit spread better of deposit loan conversion uh, has about 10, per uh, 10 times as large an effect as the, um, as the market share. Uh, in the paper, we also use the Herf and Hirschman index, so not just not the share of each bank, but the sum of squared market shares, and um, the results are very similar. Um, when we look at not the price thing outcome, but at the volume outcome, deposit growth, um, the difference is even starker. So there, the effect of conversion. Uh, so, sorry, the effect of a market share is only about 5% as large as that of uh, conversion. So the first thing this slide shows is that market shares or market concentration within the deposit market does matter. So this is consistent with Drexler, Savov, Schnabel in a different setup with a different um, identification strategy, but importantly, deposit loan conversion seems to be at least as important or even more important. Um, and I think this is important because Drexler, Savov, Schnabel talk about market power and they use market concentration as the best possible proxy. Um, but uh, I think what is important here is to show that uh, banks have as much market power or more from the cross, this cross-selling opportunity because households don't like to switch banks a lot. So this is the first of three core empirical results. The second one is about better understanding why does conversion drive the deposit spread better. 
And if we go back to the formula I showed you earlier, um, in the right term you see that uh, the net present value of uh, tomorrow's cross-selling profits, it varies with the policy rate R because of the discounting. It, that, that's clear a priori, right? But it could potentially also vary if the loan spread, the lowercase l, varies with the policy rate. To me, at least, it was not clear a priori what the relationship between the policy rate and the loan spread would be. There's all this literature showing that the deposit spread varies with the policy rate, but how about the loan spread? You can see it to start with graphically here. So in the left graph, you see that when the current policy rate is higher, the current loan spread tends to be lower. For this objective function, what matters, in fact, is not uh, the relationship between the loan spread and the current policy rate, but between the loan spread and the policy rate at onboarding. So what is the relationship between the year in which I want to win someone as a customer in which I have to set the attractive enough deposit spread and the loan spread at which I can hope to sell this mortgage to the same client later. And you see over a five year, with five years in between, the relationship is a bit weaker uh, than the relationship in the same year, but it is still clearly negative. <laughs> now let's look at this more formally. So in the first four columns, we see how much the propensity, the likelihood to borrow, uh, depends on the policy rate. We relate it to the current policy rate level, current policy rate change, or the onboarding year policy rate level and change. My favorite specification is the third of these four. And what you see here is when the policy rate level is 100 basis points higher, the propensity to borrow is 0.3 percentage points higher. So this is statistically significant because we have a huge sample, but it is not economically significant, I would think. So it looks like the propensity to borrow is driven by other things, maybe where in the life cycle someone is. Do they have a <coughs> so, uh, solid income? Do they have kids? That determines, more importantly, when they buy, buy a house. But Importantly, what spread they pay on that loan, that does vary significantly with the policy rate. So um, to see whether the loan spread or the discounting is more important, uh, what we do is we, we compute what is the net present value of the first year of the loan um, on average in our sample. So the average loan volume is 160,000 kroners, about um, 16,000 euros, divided by 10, more or less. Uh, the loan spread on average is 154 basis points. The average policy rate in our sample is 182 basis points. And the average time from bringing your first deposit to making your first, uh, taking your first mortgage is five years. So the NPV of the first year of the loan resulting from that is 2,200 uh, kroners, or about 250,000 euros. Um, now, how does that change when the policy rate changes through these two channels? If we change the discount factor from 1.02 to 1.03, um, this NPV fall, will fall uh, by about 4.7%. If we um, apply the same policy rate change and the resulting change in the loan spread, so 100, base, uh, 100 basis points higher policy rate means 13 basis points lower loan spread. And if we apply that, the NP, this NPV will fall by 8.4%. So what this is to say is in this, uh, in this equation, the effect that the policy rate has on uh, your willingness to do loss leader pricing is bigger than the effect of the discounting. But the key, the key is both subchannels matter. Both subchannels make cross selling strategies important for the positive deposit spread better. Okay, third and final um, of my three empirical findings what are the implications of all of this for loan growth? 
So the identification strategy I presented earlier relied on the fact that deposit prices are set for different demographics and therefore for different municipalities, so not the same for all clients across Norway. But I also said for refinancing, the funding is pooled at the bank level. So here, when we compare, when we relate loan growth to deposit growth, and we add these bank year fixed effects from column one to column two, the coefficient does not change much. In both cases, we find if deposit growth is one percentage point higher, then loan growth is also two thirds thereof higher. So there is, if you have more deposits, you can lend more, um, but it's not clear this is causal. What we do therefore is we instrument deposit growth with a component that can be explained uh, with, uh, cross uh, with deposit market power and with cross-selling market power. So we use basically this equation here, which I've shown, sorry. This equation where we relate the deposit spread change um, to the policy rate change and the relevant interactions, we predict uh, deposit growth, and when we relate loan growth only to what is predicted by banks optimizing behavior in their deposit market, the coefficient falls by about one third. But it stays around 50% and is very significant. So for every uh, percentage point extra deposit growth, banks will increase lending by 50% uh, thereof. So what I've just shown you does matter for deposit growth and loan growth, and therefore, presumably, for the real economy and monetary policy transmission. Okay, I will, for reasons of time, I will skip uh, any thoughts on further analysis. Let me instead conclude. So I've made four contributions here. The first one was on a theoretical level to show that if uh, onboarding and keeping a depositor today uh, can give you extra cross-selling profits tomorrow, that uh, incentivizes banks to do a loss leader strategy to offer lower deposit spreads. And this is more pronounced the lower current policy rates. And therefore, we expect a positive deposit spread better. That's a theory. The first empirical finding is to confirm this. Uh, it is to show that indeed, if there's more deposit loan conversion in a bank's business model, we expect it to have a higher deposit spread better. In this cross-selling based market power drives the deposit spread better uh, at least 10 times as much in the setup we study as does deposit market concentration alone. The second empirical finding is uh, this relationship between cross-selling intensity and the deposit spread better. It's driven at least as much by the uh, loans, the relationship between policy rate and loan spread as it is driven by the discounting thing, which is what we thought about first from an a priori perspective. Uh, and then the final empirical finding is um, all of this uh, deposit pricing matters not only for uh, deposit growth, but also for loan growth. So this is to say that really uh, deposit pricing is important for the transmission of monetary policy. That uh, brings me to the end. Thank you so much for your attention, and uh, I'm looking forward to Camelios and uh, many more interesting questions and comments now or later today and tomorrow. Thank you. And the discussion will be given by Camelia Minoyu from the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. Thank you so much uh, for having me and for um, the opportunity to discuss this super interesting paper. Um, so, um, because I'm with the Fed, um, I have a disclaimer that these are only my views. Um, and I'm gonna try to first bring us down to earth from the stratosphere of this very interesting, thought-provoking paper that I think is in the early stage, stages, but it shows a lot of promise to give us a new perspective on the deposit um, channel of monetary policy. So this paper argues that monetary policy effectiveness differs across banks through deposit rates as a function of cross-selling opportunities, the business model of banks. 
Um, Cross selling financial products and services is actually prevalent across banks, across for households and firms. Um, and the paper argues that it affords the market power. Um, with all the empirical estimates together, the thesis in this paper is that cross selling explains deposit spread betas 10 times more than deposit market alone, which is the Drexler et al. Uh, deposit uh, channel of monetary policy. So this promises to be a very powerful channel. And with this promise, of course, comes a very tall bar. Uh, and I'm going to come back, kind of build towards that tall bar as I go through my um, discussion. But I want to also show you that Citi cross sells to me. These are screenshots from my Citi app. I've been banking with Citi for 24 years because they had a, uh, a branch on campus when I went to graduate school. Um, and I am a very captive uh, depositor, um, a very inattentive also, um, uh, with a bunch of accounts. And as you can see, um, a couple of checking accounts, I never bothered to close one of them. Um, a couple of deposit uh, CDs, uh, a zero interest, and a high yield savings account that I kind of woke up to after SVB, probably like the rest of the world. And then finally, I have a mortgage loan um, with service by, by, by another non-bank uh, servi mortgage servicer. And as you can see, there's always this option to explore more products. So the bank always tries to sell more products to me. And as Christian's um, um, uh, previous work shows, there's a 20 percentage point higher probability of a depositor to get a loan from the same bank that it's, uh, it's relationship, their relationship bank than from another bank. Um, and the, those loans or additional services are, come at a premium. So the bank makes a lot of money from these captive relationships. Um, okay. So um, the organizers of the conference asked me to speak to the relevance of the paper to the current environment. So let me spend a little bit of time on that. And that gives me also background information on how to position this paper in the literature. So in the US, deposits amount to $18 trillion. A lot of um, savings are stored as deposits. They are a critical source of funding for banks, especially in the last 15 years after the global financial crisis, as banks have increased their reliance on deposits and decreased their reliance on wholesale funding. They are also a key savings tool for households. And the way we typically think about the transmission or the pass-through of the policy rate to the deposit rate is with uh, a measure called the deposit beta. Um, and uh, here on the right-hand side, we have a chart with a historical perspective on the, um, historical, on the deposit betas of US banks. There are about 4,500 banks in the US. And if we look at the time series for each bank, we see the sensitivity of the uh, total deposit rate is about 0.4, 40 uh, basis points um, of increase in deposit rate we see for every 100 basis point increase in the policy rate. In the recent tightening cycle since uh, the first quarter of 2022, the deposit betas reached this average, uh, but much faster than in previous tightening episodes, probably because of the very steep uh, pace of poli policy rate increases. So let's now take a longer term, longer term view of this phenomenon, how deposit rates uh, move with the policy rate. And it's very well known that they lag the federal funds rate. Um, in fact, we see that deposit rates are upward sticky and downwards flexible. Uh, with every tightening cycle, you see how they open up, the deposit spread opens up, and this is where the bank, the bank makes a lot of money because it's not allowing its cost of fund to increase um, uh, in, at, in, at the same pace as the policy rate. Um, and so, so this deposit spread widens during monetary policy tighten, tightenings and then very sharply closes during easings. This has also been coined as the deposit franchise of banks, the value of these sticky deposits that affords banks as depositories um, uh, the, the, the freedom of much lower cost of fund than would be implied by the stance of monetary policy. You know, this is intrinsic to banks again. Um, it, this has been coined as the deposit franchise of banks, and it is valued at a little more than $500 billion per year in the US. Um, this deposit franchise helps maintain constant NIMS because NIMS don't shrink as the policy rate uh, tightens and works as a natural hedge against the falling value of assets on the asset side of um, fixed rate assets on the, on the asset side of banks as interest rates increase. So in the current environment, the, the, the Drexler et al. deposit channel of monetary policy works very powerfully. 
what this channel is, is that monetary policy tightenings increase the deposit spread, as shown in the chart, and reduces the supply of deposits. Deposits flee the banking system, looking for yield elsewhere. Um, and the reason why banks are able to allow this deposit spread to increase is because they exercise market power in supplying deposits. So what this paper shows is that cross-selling is a significant source of market power. And as I approached the paper, I thought that there are perhaps um, offering a micro foundation for the for Drexler's channel, but it's actually proposed in the paper that it's a separate channel, okay? Because cross selling is a significant source of market power. So what is cross selling? Cross selling is this idea that um, either household depositors or or uh, corporate clients receive more products from the bank once they already have a relationship with the bank, being a deposit or a loan. Uh, Cross-selling is common to, to households, and again, um, there's previous work on that, but it's also very widespread and very profitable for firms. Uh, in fact, banks offer loans, banks that offer loans to firms also cross-sell them other profitable products, such as account and card services, uh, trade finance, supply chain finance, payments processing, foreign exchange services, and leasing, um, all sorts of information-sensitive products. Um, and so, um, you may have also heard that anecdotally around SVB, we learned that very often when banks offer a credit line to a firm, they also ask that firm to park a share of its cash as deposits with that firm. So, there, so again, cross-selling is intrinsic to, to banking. So I'm gonna ask a couple of questions and then offer some suggestions and sort of go, move gradually from very simple comments. So my first comment is about the profit maximizing problem of the bank. Uh, we can think of it as uh, the bank maximizing profits on deposits today and profits from cross-selling tomorrow, which are, of course, discounted. Um, and this is shown as the two terms in this expression. And so one, here I have a very simple question. My question is whether the bank can offer a new loan rate tomorrow. We see that L of R, which is the loan spread, is a function of the interest rate today. But the bank should be able to adjust the spread or the pricing of its loans to its captive depositors um, across periods. So I thought that it would be more realistic to allow that loan rate to, to vary over time, and I wonder what the implications for the model would be. The second comment goes straight to the core intuition, and let me read the core intuition as it's stated in the paper, and then ask a couple of questions. So the core intuition is as follows. When the policy rate increases, the net present value of future cross-selling potential declines because of higher discounted, that's a mechanical effect, and uh, because of lower loan spreads. Let's put a pin in that. I'm not sure I understand, it might be the case empirically, but I'm not sure I understand why necessarily we should have loan spreads uh, compressing uh, with higher interest rates. So as a result, the marginal benefit of increasing deposit rate declines, the pass-through to deposit rate is lower, and hence the deposit spread increases. So as I think through the intuition here, I am a bank and I want to make a lot of money from my depositors by cross-selling them future profits. I'm going to make money from two margins, the profit margin, the loan spread, which it is claimed compresses with higher interest rates, empirically. There's no theoretical result there, it's just an empirical claim. And quantity, I can do a lot of cross-selling, yeah? And so I, can have, I have these two margins, I have the profit margin and the quantity, and while the loan spreads may compress, what happens to quantity? Uh, can the bank do more cross-selling so that the quantity effect actually outweighs the profit margin squeeze effect? I think both of these terms, I honestly don't know any much about them, or in fact anything about them. I would like to see some solid empirics establishing what happens to profit margins and quantities of cross-selling as interest rates move about. The next comment is more of a suggestion. So I, I mentioned before that banks cross-sell products to firms, not only to households, and so this cross-selling channel, I think, should apply more broadly uh, to corporate borrowers as well. And I want to offer a suggestion. Uh, maybe for external validity or for boosting the evidence in, in the paper, perhaps one can use for identi empirical identification the beautiful um, policy or regulatory change that happened uh, in the late 90s in, in the US regarding the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act. Um, it culminated with the 1999 Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, which allowed commercial and investment banks to cohabit under the umbrella of commercial banks. 
basically this prompted the rise of universal banking and is a positive shock to cross-selling opportunities. Um, so to be a bit more specific, in 1987, as, as early as 1987, and we have a lot of variation across time, commercial banks were able to open so-called Section 20 subsidiaries, which offered corporate debt and bond underwriting services. And so that allowed them to engage in cross-selling and realize economies of scope uh, across financial products. There's a beautiful paper by Newman and Saidi that argues that the, that was before they got it published and the referees asked them to change the title. It was beautifully titled, Are Universal Banks Better? And the answer was yes, because they were engaging in riskier lending, lending to previously financially constrained firms that appeared riskier, but ultimately they ended up being more profitable than other firms. So I think this identification strategy would, would give us a sense of generality of the channel proposed here. And my last comment is more broad about the effectiveness of monetary policy in the aggregate. So um, as we know, a lot of the empirical monetary economics literature these days forces us to go into cross-sectional identification uh, because it's so hard to look at time series and make any sort of causal claims with, with confidence. But ultimately, policymakers care about the effects of monetary policy on the real economy. And here, because we're talking about the banking channel, through banks. And the paper uh, shows some very nice results on how deposit growth spurs loan growth. But deposit growth here is driven by both the Drexler standard deposit channel of, of deposit market power of banks, as well as the, as the cross-selling channel. So I wish that these two channels were these, um, they were split apart, separated, so we can do a horse race and we see which one is more powerful. Um, and in addition, I would like to take these this specifications further to the real economy and see if the households benefiting from cross-selling have more durable consumption, more housing consumption, and better real outcomes in general. Finally, if we're going to argue that this is a much stronger channel than DSS, then we need even more. Perhaps some long-term evidence in the time series. Um, anything that can kind of boost, boost the uh, evidence. And my last point will be about policy implications. So for right now, the demographics of the areas where the, the banks operate are used for identification. The idea is that if you have young people around in a given municipality, their uh, demand for deposits will be high, their demand for housing, mortgages will be high, and so there's a lot of cross-selling opportunities there. But if that is the main source of cross-selling opportunity, then there's not much for us as monetary policymakers to say about how we can influence that. We cannot influence demographics. So how can I translate, my question is, how can I translate the results of the paper into a policy message? What does the paper have to say about, say, comparing two economies with identical banking systems? One is super deregulated, banks can do a lot of cross-selling, and the other one has limited cross-selling opportunities. My intuition so far, based on my reading of the paper, is that the first economy would have stronger monetary policy transmission. Uh, but I would like to see all of that spelled out in the paper and kind of coming out stronger with this overall message. So to conclude, super promising and thought-provoking work. Um, I think it's uh, very exciting. My main comments is to maybe develop further the intuition. Um, I wonder if this works for cross-selling to firms as well. Is it a broad general channel or does it have to do anything with households? And finally, what are the implications for monetary policy effects of this channel in the aggregate? Thank you. Thank you, Camelia. Maybe, Christoph, you want to quickly reply to Camelia, and then we got a question from the floor. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so uh, the intensity of cross-selling will vary by setup, will vary across countries. So it was very interesting to see as a starter uh, that there is also something to that in the US. Mm -hmm. um, so Drexler, Savov, Schnabel have always coined the term deposit franchise, and in our value suggests it's deposit and cross-selling franchise, because uh, part of the value of having these depositors are these additional opportunities. Um, one good suggestion you made was to also consider cross-selling to firms. So this is households, this is like half of deposits in Norway. Um, we are at the moment preparing uh, data on firms. It's a bit more complicated because for firms, uh, the timing is different, right? Households start with deposits, will later borrow. Maybe firms start borrowing and will later bring deposits. For firms, also, uh, the 
the role of asymmetric information in a relationship might matter more than for uh, household mortgage lending. So we're still thinking about this, but I, I think it's something we should add at some point. Um, you, you, said, you, you asked uh, how does the policy rate affect uh, the loan spread, not now, mm -hmm. but for the actual loan. So we do link in what I showed uh, the loan spread, the effective loan spread are not in the year of the onboarding, but in the actual loan year. Mm -hmm. In our earlier paper, we find that after lock-in, uh, banks can charge higher loan spreads. So if you are locked in because you have deposits there, you pay more for your loan than uh, your neighbor who has their deposits elsewhere. Um, but uh, so, so we've looked at the borrowing propensity and at the loan spread, but I totally am very grateful for the good suggestion to also look at the loan volume. That's uh, something obvious we, we, we should and will do. Um, also useful uh, to, to, to think about uh, this uh, US variation in uh, cross-selling to firms. Um, yeah, and, and to, to split the effect on loan growth um, mm -hmm. also between the value of the role of the market share mm -hmm. and the role of cross-selling. We can do that. Uh, that's, that's a good thing, yeah. Um, yeah, fa last thing in terms of policy. Um, so what this suggests is that if there is less cross-selling, if households are less sticky, man the DSB is um, lower and monetary policy uh, pass-through is different. Um, it seems surprisingly uh, difficult for policy to affect uh, cross-selling, to affect the stickiness of depositors. So the EU has the, uh, tried with all kinds of banking regulation to encourage people to switch banks more. Norway has uh, had different policies um, and hasn't had much of an effect. It's, uh, households are surprisingly sticky to their bank and I'm, I'm still trying to understand what makes them so sticky. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Thanks. Questions from the floor? I have to remind you that wait for the microphone and stand up and introduce yourself. Uh, Alf Meisen, Saal, Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. So on the last point, so first I think it's a great paper and I think the Norwegian colleagues actually have a paper showing that firms usually open deposit accounts two years before they take out the first loan. Though They seem to have a similar channel, but that brings me from that paper more to the point, we should be a little bit careful about the implications, what we can do for, for uh, customers to switch banks. One reason could be they accumulate information. And it's not clear that we want necessarily, yes, they're locked in, I get this, but then we have to talk about how do you make the information transferable as well. So I would be very careful in the policy implications saying like, oh, we want more switching banks and that's good and that would change the transmission of monetary policy. That may be good, but it may not necessarily be good for consumers if that means that the loans are not as well priced and they may end up paying more. Um, I, I agree with that. Um, also, I mean, it's, uh, it's important to understand what the deposit spread better is. And, and if I know that as a central bank, uh, maybe I said higher or lower, policy rate changes, but um, I think for monetary policy transmission, uh, higher or lower DSB might both be fine. Yeah, and, and there's cons to, to making them switch around more, yeah. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for this very interesting paper. It was uh, about time. Uh, I, I, I really wanted to see a paper about cross-selling. Uh, I have just one question, which is related to a companion paper of uh, uh, DSS about uh, maturity transformation, where they stress the importance of deposits that allows banks to actually match the maturity of loans because they're very sticky, and hence they're actually really important in their hedging of interest rate risk. And so I was wondering, how correlated is your measure of conversion with the, the bank business model of, say, for instance, the loan to deposit ratio or deposit to total liabilities ratio, um, because that might matter, right? I might, I might not want to pass through too much of a, of a um, policy rate decrease uh, uh, if I risk of losing my source uh, of uh, long-term financing if, if we believe that deposits are sticky and they finance our long-term loans. Thank you. It's a good question. I, I haven't looked at this yet, uh, but it's, uh, it's something I can and, and will look at. 
It's a good idea. Thank you. There was a question from Hans. Okay, Hans de Rezek, Jo Leuven. So I have a, I like the idea of cross-selling. So I'm just wondering if you would tell this narrative to bankers, whether they would be convinced of this. Because typically what they would think is, you know, the mortgage, that's the time where you really need to have the client because, you know, then you have the client for 20 years and after that you will be able to cross-sell. So I'm just trying to understand, you know, whether suppose you would do the same exercise related to mortgages, you know, and thinking about, let's say, cross-selling opportunities in terms of, mutual funds, what have we, you know, whether you would have, let's say, similar type of, similar type of insights. Thanks. I mean, what we see in Norway is they, they start with deposits and the deposits are enough to make them sticky. Uh, and if anything, they would switch banks when refinancing the mortgage. That's also what I see in Switzerland, where I, I live now. People, for the first mortgage, they are sticky. They, they, they only trust advice from the bank they know. When they already have that mortgage, they have that house, five or 10 years later, they are more likely to switch. So I would, I would think it will depend a bit on the context. What is the contract duration of the mortgages? Um, yeah. Are there other questions? David. Yeah. Awesome paper. So um, I'm, my question comes from this von Saden Rajan type of dynamic competition paper. So basically, what I'm thinking about here is, can you separate between the ones that are already locked in to the ones that will be locked in and are, you know, are gonna be super stick, but for some reason, I don't know why, age or something, are not yet locked in. Why? Because I guess that from the intuitions that at least I have from those papers, the pass-through should be totally different. Like if you're, if you're a guy that, you know, it's gonna be locked in and you're gonna be very sticky, there's all this cross-saying that's gonna happen, but there's gonna be probably even much higher than one changes of monetary policy rate through your deposit because I really wanna grab you now. Once you are in, that's, that's the end of the game for you, so then maybe on the average you have much more of these people and of the other. I don't know if it's plausible, you've already done it and I missed it or something like that. So, so, so since clients are fairly sticky, I think it takes a much bigger loss leader um, incentive to onboard you and lock you in in the first place. The banks also are careful to have uh, negative deposit rates, for example, because they don't want to lose you after lock-in, but that, that it's easier to keep you than to onboard you in the first place. Um, I guess what I could do is I could... Uh, compare, for example, households who have deposits with a different bank, but have some deposits to households that don't have any deposit account at all yet, uh, for example, when they start university or something. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so thank you, Christoph and Camelia.